Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's uh, my and Dr. Ramalingam's pleasure to uh, welcome a friend and colleague, Dr. Thomas Stinchcom from uh, Duke University. Tom and I have known each other for 20 years or so. The most important thing for about Tom is that his wife's a pharmacist. Um, <laughs> right now, Tom is uh, head of the Alliance Working Group for Thoracic Malignancies. He was at UNC for a number of years where he did fellowship and uh, trained with and under Mark Sosinski, and so certainly is a friend of many of us here, including Ram and Taufik and myself. So uh, Tom's done a lot of work with thinking about targeted therapies, both the in lung cancer, both in the conventional sense and in somewhat the non-conventional sense, but ways that make uh, molecular sense in therapies uh, across the board. So without any further ado, I want to thank you, Tom, for coming, and uh, we look forward to a great talk. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, this is obviously a broad topic and a very dynamic topic. I've tried to focus on the, the role of investigating initiated trials uh, in this space because I think they uh, remain an important part of this, uh, uh, our trial opportunities. I've sort of divided it into uh, these broad categories. First looking at EGFR or tyrosine kinase combinations. Um, then looking at the EGFR tyrosine kinase and uncommon uh, mutations and brigatinib after a second generation ELK inhibitor, then TDM1 and HER2 overexpressing and RET uh, rearrangement. I think the last two are uh, things that are very promising but are not really re ready for routine care now. I think many of the audience is familiar with these uh, trials that have all compared uh, an EGFR TKI to a platinum doublet. I think there's a consistent improvement in response with the response rates around 60 to 80 percent and a uh, consistent improvement in progression-free survival of about a median of 10 to 12 months. I think the sort of the challenge is that 10 to 12 months is a gr great improvement for lung cancer doctors, but I think for patients who tend to be younger and healthier that the, the progression-free survival is somewhat underwhelming, and I think we really need to see if we can improve that progression-free survival, and that, that was the impetus for several of our trials. The first trial I'll talk about is the combination of verlotinib and bevacizumab. Uh, this uh, represented some of the clinical data that uh, sparked the interest in exploring this combination. Uh, this is a somewhat antiquated trial design in that patients were enrolled without any uh, biomarker selection. They were then randomized either to verlotinib and placebo or verlotinib and bevacizumab. This was a second-line trial um, at the time. And like many of the trials of that era, with no biomarker selection, the targeted therapy didn't reveal a tremendous benefit. As you see there, the primary endpoint of median overall survival was nine months in both arms, with a modest difference in progression-free survival and um, objective response. At the time that this trial was done, tissue collection was not mandatory for trials, and I think that that meant that they had a limited number of samples. And there was a subset of 30 patients with confirmed EGFR mutations. And the patients who got erlotinib placebo compared to erlotinib bevacizumab had a um, shorter progression-free survival and a trend towards a shorter overall survival. I think the challenge is, is that this was only 30 patients, and they weren't balanced for prognostic uh, factors and uh, subsequent treatments. So it's really hard to uh, make any uh, decisions based on this small subset. Importantly, there was a preclinical rationale that this combination may work better. Um, Xenograft models of EGFR sensitive resistance and acquired resistance have shown that the EGFR and uh, VEGF inhibition with erlotinib, uh, suzumab, or uh, venitinib, which also hits both targets, did result in a uh, greater uh, suppression of tumor growth as represented on the uh, curve on the right. This is another uh, xenograft model that looks at the EGFR uh, exon 19, and this model has a T790 mutation. The slide on the right represents that there's a uh, significant reduction in the tumor volume or, uh, with the combination of gefitinib, bevacizumab, and that's greater than the uh, vehicle gefitinib alone or bevacizumab alone. The slide on the left represents the tumor growth over time, showing that the, the responses are sustained. So within the Alliance Committee, we uh, developed this concept of uh, uh, prospectively testing this, uh, looking at the EGFR exon 19 and exon 21. Uh, patients were randomized to erlotinib or erlotinib bevacizumab. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival investigator, um, and the secondary endpoints were response overall survival. 
the time this trial was being launched, the Japanese were launching a trial of very similar design, and we met with the statisticians and built in a pre-planned combined sub, uh, statistical analysis of the two trials, um, which I'll get to a little bit later, because I think if there's trials that are international or multiple groups testing the same hypothesis, we really want to make sure that we try and coordinate the care to get the most out of the trials. Passiani, my uh, colleague who many of you probably know from his work in the ISIS space, uh, developed the translational medicine questions. At the time, CTNA was a relatively novel technology. We wanted to see the correlation with the tumor biopsy and the CTDNA. I think more importantly, he was looking forward to see if he can detect the T790M on CTDNA prior to radiographic progression, and also looking at novel mechanisms resistance. And also, he's become very interested in using CTNA as a pharmacodynamic uh, measure of uh, activity. So like, uh, unfortunately, we launched the trial about the same time the Japanese, but due to the higher prevalence of the EGFR mutations and better execution of the trial, their trial completed uh, first. Um, and there's, uh, th there were two big differences uh, in the two trials, is that they didn't allow enrollment of brain mets, and that their PFS was an independent radiological review. Their trial met the primary endpoint, as you see here, a very robust uh, improvement in the progression-free survival. If you really kind of look at the yellow curve, I think most of the benefit is that there's not that early progression in the first couple months, and then that's sort of sustained throughout the time period. The European group was also looking at this uh, same question, but in a slightly different manner. Uh, there, it looked at erlotinib bevacizumab in a single arm uh, trial, uh, phase two trial. The primary endpoint was progression free survival, and they looked at T790M status at baseline, and they divided them into the positive and the negatives. And they used a, a different uh, method of testing for the T790M that was a little bit more sensitive. If you look at the top line, the response rate was around 80%. The progression free survival was around 14 months. But if we kind of really look at the patients who had the T790M at the baseline, they appeared to get uh, greater benefit. Um, the response uh, median progression free survival was 16 months. Well, if your T790M in negative is around 10 months. And actually, this trial, combined with the Japanese trial, was enough to get this combination approved in uh, Europe. It's not currently approved in the US. Now, for the junior faculty, I made two cr critical mistakes when I did this trial. I was so desperate to get it funded that I didn't pay close enough attention to the budget or the site selection. And the budget was un underfunded to the point that academic centers would not enroll um, or, or the crew. And what I've done is I've graphed the months at the bottom and the enrollment there in the orange, as you can see, we went several years without uh, any real enrollment. Then with a, a budgetary readjustment, we were able to complete the trial. Also, the Japanese trial was presented at ASCO, and that helped uh, um, uh, drive enrollment as well, because I think it gave it a little bit more credibility. Um, so I think if you're doing, these are very mundane things to pay attention to, and uh, frankly, I find them somewhat boring, but I, I paid a heavy price for not paying attention. So if you're in the room and doing this, please uh, pay attention to some of those more mundane issues. Uh, now, uh, this is a question I've asked myself, and you're sort of probably politely asking yourself too, why is this trial still relevant? And I don't think, I think it is less relevant than when we, we conceived of it, but I think this is a case where the translational medicine questions will actually in many ways sort of salvage the trial because I think there's an interest of, well, if VEGF and EGFR tyrosine kinase combination work with erlotinib, maybe they'll work with osimertinib, which we'll talk about next. I think we really want to also look at why does this combination work? Are the mechanisms of resistance different? Why does it we suppress uh, acquired resistance? And this may ultimately help us with future drug development because right now the combination is somewhat cumbersome with an IV drug and an oral drug, but if you could get some drug that maybe could uh, do both in, in a single pill, I think it would be more enjoyable for our patients, and that may help us uh, at this point. Um, one of the reasons why that trial is irrelevant is ROM's work, and this represents his phase three trial of um, looked at uh, our exon 19 and 21. Uh, looking at uh, patients who were stratified by mutation type, then were compared to osimertinib uh, or lotinib or jafitinib, which represented the standard arm. And patients were allowed to cross over to the standard of care os osimertinib if they had a T790M. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival by investigator. 
And if you look here, the right represents the primary endpoint of progression-free survival. There's a robust improvement in progression-free survival with a median of 18.9 uh, versus a 10 on the osimertinib arm, and the hazard ratio is 0 0.46. There's a trend to overall survival improvement, but the, it's uh, immature with only 25% data maturity. So that p-value will less than 0 0.5. It does not represent statistical significance. If we look at what is the mechanism that this is working, it's, the response rate is very similar between the two, but the duration of response is what uh, uh, and, uh, improves the progression-free survival as well. And I think what you're seeing is that this medication suppresses the development of resistance. Well, previously we treated, and then we waited for resistance to develop, and then treated. And inevitably, only a fraction of our patients crossed over to the second line, despite everyone's uh, best efforts. We were sort of anticipating that this trial would be positive based on the phase two. Um, and then Duke is an NCCN uh, institution. And they sent out this RFP looking at uh, for phase one or two trials in EGFR mutant on small cell lung cancer, looking at mechanisms of resistance. And I put some of the criteria here. I think the critical criteria that we faced was studies were required to receive the first dose of study medication within 10 months of study approval. and had to be completed accrual within two years. And so that's a relatively uh, stringent timeline in terms of executing the trial. And the funding, as you see there, was uh, uh, somewhat limited at this point. Because uh, I worked with Posse on the previous trial, I, I reached out to him because he had been interested in the combination of osimertinib and uh, selenib, and he'd done some preclinical work looking at the EGFR tyrosine kinase resistance. And it th he thought it was either due to MAP, MAP kinase upregulation or uh, regulation of the inhibitory regulations of ERK signaling, and that MAC and, uh, ERK inhibition could restore sensitivity to an irreversible EGFR TKI and prevent the emergence of resistance. And what you see there is uh, the tumor cells, and with the uh, uh, control, the MAC inhibitor is the CL100, and then the irreversible EGFR inhibitor is the third bar, and then the combination you see is much better at suppressing. The top graph represents the exon 19 T790M, and the bottom is the exon uh, 21 and T790M models. He also looked at this in a, uh, different models, looking at the combination of the irreversible EGFR TKI and tramitinib, and it's uh, inhibited the emergence of the T790M uh, resistance, as well as the independent mechanisms. Um, and uh, he also looked at a model that uh, HCC827 with MET amplification uh, as the primary mechanism of resistance, and it appeared to suppress the, the growth of that. Uh, the combination you see is the red dots that are at the bottom in terms of uh, development of resistance. We also had uh, a, the TATIN trial, which I think you have open here, that uh, looked at the, the cell of metinib, uh, and they found that we had a, a randomized phase two dose from that trial of 80 milligrams uh, daily of the osimertinib, and uh, the cell of metinib, 75 milligrams twice daily for four days and three days off. It seemed to have a tolerably toxicity profile with no grade three uh, adverse events. And they did see some responses in patients who had progressed after EGFR TKI therapy. This was sort of very preliminary data at the time that we developed this trial. So with this, we sort of developed a combination looking at the very similar EGFR patient population using the osimertinib and cellumetinib uh, dose uh, from the TATIN trial, uh, with Posse leading this trial and coordinated out of Dana-Farber, and with Duke being the, the second site, and your friend Suzanne being our statistician. we really had a challenge with what is the objective to this, because we're really under some difficult time constraints for a trial. Those of us who do trials know it's very hard to complete any trial in two years. Sometimes it takes you nine months to get through the IRB. Um, and so we chose the response rate with the null being 70% and the positive being around 90%, which gave us a reasonable power and one decided error of about 0.1. We investigated progression-free survival, and to, it's estimated to move the progression-free survival from 19 months, which was the phase two PFS, to 25 months with a hazard ratio of 0.76. It would require 320 patients, and it was estimated it would take seven years uh, to, to complete the accrual, uh, um, which would be long by anyone's standards. And I think that this reflects a, a challenge with the targeted therapies. We're not really making, there are modest improvements in response rates, but they're not great improvements in response rates. And so what are we going to use as a surrogate endpoint? And if our PFS is now up to two years, we're going to have to follow these patients for a long time, and our, our, our ability to make progress and 
develop new therapies is going to be, in some ways, more challenging than previously because of our, our, our successes. Posse's working on the uh, correlative science aspect. He's uh, looking at serial um, ctDNA, um, looking at the um, association between objective and progression free response rate. I think there's a over exuberance about this technology right now, in my opinion, uh, because I think some of the patients will not have ctDNA detectable, and some patients will respond but not have a corresponding dip in the circulating tumor DNA levels. But we hope that this will be the first step towards trying to develop a, a, some form of a surrogate endpoint. Um, and what we might get out of this is that the patients who are not going to have the durable responses have no things, and maybe those patients will be candidates for double therapy. Well, the ones that have a very robust reduction may be the candidates for single therapies. If you could do sort of a risk-adapted strategy, I think that's been adopted in the heme malignancies quite well. But I think it's going to be a challenge for the field as we go forward. The next area that I have had some interest in is sort of the uncommon mut EGFR mutations, because I think we all focus on the exon 19 and the exon uh, 21 uh, L8685R, uh, and these are the ones that are about 80% of the patients we see, but about 20% of patients will have what we call uncommon mutations, and of those, uh, the exon 18, uh, the exon 20, and the exon 21 represent about 10 to 15% of the mutations. We know that these uh, mutations have a lower affinity for the EGFR TKI, so the binding is not as robust as it was with the exquisitely sensitive ones. And they have uh, greater sensitivity than the EGFR wild type, so they're often referred to as sort of partial sensitizing mutations. And in cell lines, it looks like the mutation subtype and the EGFR TKI can affect outcomes, but I think that this is still uh, an open question. When we kind of look at the, our clinical data, you see that there are really sort of multiple subset analysis. Um, I think the afatinib is probably the data because that was, those patients were enrolled, and then there was a prospective trial, and then they went back and did a subset. But they found 38 patients there. The response rate was around 71%, and the progression-free survival was about 11 months. And I think that they are going to go try and get an FDA approval based on this and other data for this uncommon mutation subtype. The other trials look at uh, are from 38 to 154 patients look at a variable number of EGFR TKIs. Response rates are more modest, 20 to 40 percent. Progression free survival anywhere from three to eight months. And I think that this reflects that there are multiple therapies. The definition of uncommon mutation was somewhat uh, uh, variable in terms of the enrollment and that they were retrospective. And so uh, this is a, a Duke trial that we're going to open soon. And this is a relatively, frankly, simple trial to ask a very simple question. Um, and it, that uh, looking at the exon 18, exon 20, and exon 21, we've pre-specified the EGFR mutations to try and reduce the heterogeneity in the, the enrollment. Um, and then we give them osimertinib to disease progression, unacceptable toxicity, or withdrawal of consent with the primary endpoint of objective response rate at this point. Uh, looking at the secondary endpoints of progression-free survival, safety, and overall survival. We will do a subset analysis by the mutation subtype, but I, I doubt that that will be valuable because if we assume that there's going to be 15 patients in each arm, it's not going to be hard to make any definitions. I think the long-term goal is we want to demonstrate that osimertinib will probably have the same activity as afatinib, but be better tolerated because a lot of patients on afatinib need a dose reduction uh, related to the EGFR tyrosine kinase uh, uh, irreversible binding on the skin and the gut. And so I think that this will be hoping to open soon, and then long term we hope we may pursue a bigger trial that's more definitive. The anaplastic lymphoma kinase uh, is the, the other large group of uh, molecularly targeted therapies for patients with lung cancer. Right now, uh, about Five to eight percent of patients with non-small cell lung cancer with adenocarcinoma histology have an uh, ALK rearrangement. That number will vary depending on the prevalence of your uh, smoking history and uh, other variables. Cruzotinib, seritinib, and elecnib are available as first-line uh, therapy. Brigatinib, seritinib, and elecnib are available as second-line agents. But loratinib has a breakthrough designation at this point, and I think the optimal sequence and activity of the agents after the next generation LTKIs is unknown. Preclinical data is available on the acquired resistance mutation and the activity of the next generation. I think that this represents the sort of the standard of care for patients with um, 
uh, ELK positive. There's a J. Alex trial that enrolled patients in Japan. They compared electinib to cruzotinib with a primary endpoint of progression free survival. As you see there, the response rate was numerically higher, around 92%. The median was not reached versus 10.2 months. And then in the uh, international trial, the PFS was much uh, longer as well, 26 months versus 10 months. And so electinib became the preferred first line therapy for the NCCN guidelines. Um, most of us think that this is a tremendous advance, and I think that the lecnib reduces the rate of CNS metastases. I think the question then becomes, what's next? I mean, I think at this point, uh, we know that uh, on the right, this represents the uh, rate that's crizotinib treated patients, and we know that with crizotinib, around 20 to 25 percent of patients will get a uh, secondary ELK uh, rearrangement uh, mutation or uh, tyrosine kinase mutation. With seritinib, the rate goes up to about 50%. Same thing with electinib. And there's a higher prevalence of the G1220R uh, mutation. I think the interest is that we've all seen this tr uh, slide that makes a complicated thing very simple and that you, the things are labeled green, yellow, and red. And what these are looking at is the specific agents in the IC50s where it, there are some mutations that appear to confer resistance, such as this mutation right here that confers resistance to electinib. This mutation that actually confers resensitivity to crizotinib. I think the challenges are that when we sort of look a little bit closer, we see that at 50.1, at you're in the yellow, and at 49.9, you're in the green. So there's a, there's a, there's a, the lines are somewhat arbitrary, and is this really enough to make our, our treatment decisions? The other challenge, I think, with this field is half the patients don't get a mutation. And what is their mechanism of resistance? Is it ELK independent? Is it copy number change? Is there, uh, and I think we need to also look into why are those patients maybe less uh, elk dependent in their uh, at time of disease progression. So this is a, a trial that was uh, investigating initiated. It's run through a group called Atomic, which is centered in uh, University of Colorado, where it looks at a number of academic uh, centers with Penn's a part of it, USC, Jack West's uh, group in uh, Seattle. Uh, UNC was um, there, and what it's hoping to do is develop a uh, consortium for doing investigate initiated trials where the centers have been sort of pre-standardized and there's a, a, a cohesive group to help move them through. The CRO manages it. It's a CRO called Criterion, so it's not a, a, the institution isn't responsible for the data management. And this is a trial that's actually been in development for, for a couple of years, um, and what we're looking at is we're requiring a core biopsy of the progressive of the lesion for enrollment. They have to have any second generation ELK inhibitor. Then they'll get the bergatinib at the standard dose, 90 milligrams for seven days, at a, uh, followed by 180 milligrams. And then after that, we're really looking at uh, uh, an optional biopsy at the time of disease progression, trying to see if we can get um, uh, biopsies post bergatinib to see if the molecular uh, signature has sort of changed. I think we're also really curious, what is the compliance going to be with this uh, optional biopsy? Many of these patients are progressing. They're uh, very educated and active patients. They might be moving on to the next trial in a very rapid manner at this point. Um, disease assessment will be every two cycles. And then Gardens uh, providing the CT DNA on this for similar uh, mechanisms. And I think that that's another issue with our, our liquid biopsies is that these have really been shown to be beneficial in patients with EGFR mutations where you're looking for three specific mutations, the exon 19, the LA58R, and the T790M. Detecting the ELK rearrangements is much more technically difficult, and you're now looking at multiple mutations. And I have some hesitancy that the field's almost had a rush to adopt these, especially in the ELK space, um, because I think that the validity of this is, still needs to be sort of prospectively evaluated. Um, on this trial, um, Bob, Bob Doyle will be doing the translational work for us. Um, primary uh, objective is a response, looking at duration of response, progression-free survival. We're prospectively uh, looking at intracranial, extracranial PFS because I think that this has been a uh, sanctuary site and a frequent site of disease progression and overall survival. And we're looking at the, the trying to make some association with the uh, type of mutation and response and resistance at the time of progression in the CT and A as a pharmacodynamic marker as well as a mechanism of detecting resistance. So this trial has been ongoing. We've run into some uh, problems that have really, uh, I think, required some modifications uh, of the trial. 
Well, one, I think we found with this that many of the patients had been on multiple different ALK inhibitors over a number of different years. They were very heavily pretreated. I think there was some concern that these patients may have multiple mechanisms of resistance and treating with a, a brigatinib may or may not work. And so there's a heterogeneity in the, the trial. Then I think even a, excellent centers were having trouble getting sufficient tissue on the bi repeat biopsies. And I think that this is uh, going to be a challenge um, going forward. Even under the best of circumstances, sometimes it can be hard to get adequate tissue. So we've added another cohort, and that's for patients with previous electinib, part of this is this kind of reflects the current practice pattern. You know, this is the question that we have. We don't know what to do with, uh, after electinib. And this will also make it such a more homogeneous uh, patient population um, in terms of the mechanisms of resistance and the prior therapy. Then this was Ross's idea that he wanted to see if dose escalation of brigatinib in patients who are tolerating having disease progression could um, provide some benefit. I think that there's the main focus of this group will be patients who've had CNS progression. Maybe the higher dose will get better blood bank barrier penetration. Um, but I think that this will be sort of another uh, signal finding study at this point. It's now expanded to about 120 patients, and so uh, it's going to be a, a relatively big study. And that sort of, I think, dovetails in Wally's work here as a chair of the NRG. Um, this is what's known as the ALK master protocol, and it's uh, trying to take the Gainer paper and apply it and get prospective clinical uh, data where patients will go with progression on LTKI, will undergo mutational testing using Foundation 1. Then they'll be assigned to a specific uh, cohort based on um, the, the mutation. Importantly, patients who don't have a mutation will be randomly assigned to one of the five uh, study drugs that are available at this point. And this is a large trial, around 660 patients, so it's, we're going to be a, a large effort over a number of years uh, at many centers to do this. And I think uh, some of the value we'll find out is um, uh, the mutational testing, how many patients are positive, what, you know, what's the failure rate for that. I've seen figures of 10 to 30 percent. CTNA will be connected on the first 200 patients, trying to really prospectively evaluate the correlation. And I think that this is a massive intergroup effort to the uh, TCN, TN, the clinical trials group. I think the next group of, uh, is the HER2 positive non-small cell lung cancer. I think that this has been somewhat of uh, interest to us. Um, I think the HER2 overexpression is assessed by IHC is associated with a poor prognosis. In contrast to brassic and gastric cancer, HER2 overexpression does not always co-occur with HER2 amplification. Um, and HER2 amplifications and mutations are generally mutually exclusive. And I think the challenge is that it hasn't been standardized in how we define this. If you look at the IHC, it can include 15 to 30 percent of patients. If you look at 3 plus, it's 2 to 6 percent of patients. The amplification is around 2 to 6 percent, and the mutation is about 1 to 5 percent. So this, I was working in alliance with a trial of TDM1 versus docetaxel. Uh, Solange Peters was working in the ETOP group with a, uh, the same concept. We hit a roadblock, basically, in that there was a lot of concern at the company about the, the molecular testing, how who's going to define HER2 positivity. And to, to their credit, what they came back is they said, what we want to do is this screening study, where we'll do the biomarker centrally with the, the Ventana test, the IHC2 and 3 plus. And you'll combine efforts, and we'll hope to see if there's a, a worth pursuing. And then we'll come back to you with maybe a more randomized design. And so the patients were enrolled. They were divided into two cohorts, IHC 2 plus at uh, 20, IHC 3 plus at 20, then given uh, TDM1, uh, 3.6 milligrams every three weeks, and then fouled. And the primary endpoint was objective response rate by investigator. Uh, endpoint, other endpoints were PFS duration, overall safety, and biomarker analysis. This is, I think, uh, the critical part is that the centralized testing, the standardization of the IHC, because I think that this can be very variable. IHC is required to be weak to moderate, uh, complete basolateral lateral membranes for activity in 10% of the cells to be 2 plus. To be IHC 3 plus, you had to have strong, complete basolateral or lateral membranes activity in 10% of uh, tumor cells. Then they did an exploratory analysis looking at the gene amplification, HER2 amplification, HER2 mnRNA, and the next generation sequencing was done by Foundation Medicine. Oh, 
For the purposes of this talk, I'll, I'll focus on the IHC 2 and 3 plus cohorts because I think that was the primary endpoints of the study and the other ones are exploratory. So this is, represents the uh, water fall plots in the IHC 2 plus cohort. There were um, no responses. Uh, in the IHC 3 plus, there was a uh, 20% response rate at this point, and so a relatively modest response rate. When we look at the uh, spider plots in the IHC 2 plus, there were some patients who had stable disease for a prolonged period of uh, time, over six months. As you can see, one patient out to about 20 months. Now, IHC 3 plus, there were those responders and three patients who had stable disease for around uh, greater than six months, so there was some clinical benefit. At the same time, we were doing that trial, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group was doing this trial, uh, and it was a slightly different design, and it was a basket design that they took patients with HER2 mutations, and they represented cohort one. Then HER2 amplified, uh, uh, cohort two was lung cancer, cohort three was bladder and urinary cancers in court four with other solid tumors. And they presented this data uh, with uh, HER2 mutation positive group. What they found is that the response rate was 44%. Eight out of 18 patients res responded. They met their uh, primary endpoint of the study at this point. Um, and this was presented by B Bob Lee uh, from Memorial at ASCO last year. When we look at the progression-free survival, it's about four months. Uh, um, if you look at the median duration response, around five months. But I think that this needs to be thought of carefully because you can see the arrows. There are a number of patients still on treatment, and this may get better as the data matures at this um, further. I think the critical thing with both these studies is that the response rate is relatively modest. And I think the question is really how are we going to select the, 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 the patients for this? I think the IH3 uh, testing is not sufficient on its own to justify the, the use of this uh, drug, which is quite expensive and, and you know, a 20% response rate. That may be able to be used as a screener test, and you'll probably need like a, a secondary test to, to, for benefit at that point uh, to use this. I think the HER2 mutations is very intriguing. Uh, it may be even included in the NCCN guidelines on that back page and the, the table in the, the latest version. Um, but I think that this is a relatively small cohort of 18 patients. I'm sure that they're enrolling more patients, but I think we would like to have some more perspective data before we start using this uh, drug at our, um, uh, routinely at this point. Um, but I think that this represents a you know, about 5% of our patient population, and they tend to be younger, never smokers, so ideally we would find some way to... I don't know what happened. <laughs> well, this is a good break. Any questions? <laughs> Mm. And the memorial her to mutant population. Do you know whether there's any significant overlap? So we went back and looked at ours. There are some overlaps because um, in ours we had the IHC as well, um, where the patients with uh, I think three of the four responders had high IHC um, as well. But it's not perfect. In memorial they didn't have as much overlap. But then that raises the question of the IHC testing, you know, is it the same in both centers? Because I think it can be notoriously fickle at this point. Um, the other challenge is that the IHC testing is different for breast and gastric cancer. And, you know, it has to be, I think this look at the gastric is more representative of the testing in lung cancer. And I think if you think about breast cancer, there's, they've spent 20 years trying to get the IHC testing correct, you know, at some point. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, um, looking at the next rare source tumor type is, I think, the RET rearranged non-small cell lung cancer. I think that this um, is a, an intriguing population. It represents about 1 to 2% of adenocarcinomas, but if you enrich for the 8% of patients who are EGFR and ALK add negative, um, it's about 8%. Uh, Red is a proto-oncogene, and it is rearranged. About 70 75% of them are with a KIF-5B. Um, other ones are the, uh, listed there. They may be more common in uh, different tumor types. 
These have been investigated in multi-targeted tyrosine kinase uh, tr trials and phase two trials. I think to date the challenge has been these have uh, led to frequent dose reductions due to off-target toxicity with the VEGF and EGFR toxicity to the point that you wonder how effectively are you hitting the target because you've had to re dose reduce the drug um, at this point. I think the other unique thing about doing studies in this group is that the response to platinum doublet is pretty good. It's around 51 percent, median progression free survival about eight months, and the overall survival around 25 months. Um, and that was retrospective, 84 patients. But I think if you talk to people, they often will say, oh, my retro patient really responded quite well to the, the platinum pemetrexid. And, and um, so I think the question is, is target therapy is going to be better than chemotherapy in this patient population or our current targeted therapies? And these represent sort of the phase two trials of um, the multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors looking at them, and you see that they're small trials, 17 to 26 patients. The objective response rate was around uh, 20 to 47 percent, the progression free survival five months, and then if you look at the rate of dose reductions, there's, they're quite significant at this point. Um, and this raises questions about the tolerability and the quality of life for our patients, because the premise of targeted therapy is that you'll have better activity with less toxicity, and I'm not sure if we're achieving either of those with this group of drugs as it stands. So this is an um, industry-sponsored phase one trial that uh, we have open at Duke as well as other centers. And I think it really represents uh, what, what we're seeing with other targeted therapies as we're trying to increase the potency and reduce the off-target toxicities. Um, and as you see there, blue 667, these are the IC50s in nanomolar. And it looks at the uh, wild type, and the, you see there the different ret uh, rearrangements and uh, mutations. And then you look at the blast column, and that represents the VEGF uh, inhibition. And you see the ratio of the VEGF to the red inhibition is much better with, in terms of uh, the blue 667 than the other drugs that were really developed as multi-target kinase inhibitors. The blue is uh, 667 is more selective and is active against a gatekeeper resistance mutation and demonstrated activity in Xenograph and PDX models uh, to date. And so they've designed this trial that's really looking at the um, RET positive uh, patients, uh, any RET rearrangement in the solid tumor. We're in the phase one dose escalation design right now where patients are enrolled in th three to six uh, patient cohorts, allowing up to 12 patients, and we're doing one daily dosing. I think the intriguing thing is that we will open to the part two, a randomized phase two design uh, with RET previously treated, RET uh, Untreat, uh, untreated uh, non-small cell lung cancer with no RET inhibitor, medullary thyroid cancer, and then any solid tumor with a RET rearrangement can be enrolled. I think the interesting thing about this study is that it will pay for the airfare of these centers. And I've listed the centers there, MD Anderson, Mass General, Oregon Health Sciences, UC Irvine, Penn, and Duke. And there's actually a patient on the study who's flying from Ohio to Oregon for this. And I think as we get to the recruit these rare genotypes, I think you're going to have to see more uh, support for the, these patients to, to travel in order to get enrolled them in a timely manner. We've opened this trial at Duke, and the problem has not been identifying the RET rearrangements is that uh, the two patients we've seen, one had prolonged QT and one had renal insufficiency that kept them going on trial, and so you have you know, almost two competing uh, or synergistic problems that you face is the one find the rare re rearrangement, then meeting all the uh, 20 to 30 criteria, uh, eligibility criteria can sometimes be really challenging. And this is a shameless plug, but if you have a range patient, uh, can you please send them to me? Because <laughs> um, we'll be happy to treat them and see them. I actually even saw medullary thyroid cancer last week for my first time ever um, in preparation for this trial, so I've been expanding my clinical repertoire. Um, I, I wanted to leave some time for questions, and I'm sorry. Uh, and I, I think I really wanted to a couple things as we kind of look across the landscape. I think uh, the rage right now is immunotherapy, actually chemotherapy with immunotherapy, but targeted therapy will really continue to be the dominant paradigm, I think, for these molecular subsets. And I think that we've made tremendous progress on this. And then the reason why we've made progress is we've had an understanding of the molecular biology and mechanisms of resistance that have led to this. I, I think I find it somewhat disconcerting in the, the current environment. We're now doing trials of four versus three th drugs and, you know, no selection factors. And if they, they improve, uh, that's great. And that's sort of the end of the story. I think that in many ways that's going back to the time of the 90s when Ram and I started where we, we did that with chemotherapy. And, 
other issues, and I think that that's one of the concerns. Um, I think the other thing that we look at is efforts like the ELK master protocol and the RET trial. We're really trying to coordinate across uh, NCI cooperative groups and other things to really make sure that the, these rare patient populations of the trials are completed in a timely manner and across centers through the work like with Atomic and other groups to try and make things as simple as possible. The other issue I think is that uh, the rate of investigating initiated trials is going down I think compared to when we started in terms of the availability. Um, and I think that these will remain important, I think, especially for junior faculty, because you get to sort of design the trial, control the trial, and you know, really own the trial at this point, rather than being sort of a, a passive passenger like you are in any other trials. Other issues that the, I think the cooperative group trials, there are fewer of them than when we started, but they uh, remain important. I think a lot of the ideas that uh, I've come up with become through my collaborations with them, and maybe the trial was performed outside the cooperative group, but it's the relationships and that, that um, really made that happen, um, and it sort of enriched my career. Um, then I think the translation medicine collaboratives really do sort of strengthen your um, study proposals and then in some cases they're actually in some can be argued more important than the clinical outcomes because they can really elucidate the mechanisms of resistance and other factors that, that you can be applied to the next uh, trial and I've generally collaborated with people at uh, different centers uh, just uh, based on availability but I think you know if you can bridge those centers it can really help uh, move the field forward um, at, at this point. Um, and I th hope that that sort of il illustrates some of the take-home points that I tried to make uh, uh, based on the trials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm ready for questions. So, right, question back here. Uh, so, a lot of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, while they may be selective and targeted towards tumors, also modulate normal immune responses. The Alex trial in particular, I'm impressed by the plateau of progression free survival. Mm. First question is, is that really a durable progression free survival with longer follow up and their own experience with those patients? And secondly, is there any evidence that some of those patients without progression have that this therapy might have elicited an endogenous immune response? So I think looking at the, I'll take the first question, the plateau, I think that uh, there are of the people with crizotinib, which was developed seven years ago, about 10% of them will be on there for five years. And I think with, most of us clinically have also treated patients with erlotinib and had a few great responders who've been on it for five or seven years. The, the challenge is we, we can't figure out which ones they are. There's some thought that co concurrent mutations may influence that. So I think the plateau is real, and I think that um, uh, it probably will not be permanent, though. We're not looking at a, uh, per, uh, inevitably, I think, mechanism resistance. Generally, these tyrosine kinase, to my knowledge, have not really elicited an immune response. And interestingly, I think this is the one group of patients that have a very low response rate to immune therapy, around 4%, partly because they have a lower tum tumor mutation burden, less T cell infiltration, generally speaking. And so I don't think that, and these tyrosine kinase inhibitors may modulate that uh, small segment of patients, but it's not going to be a large segment that we can really combine tyrosine kinase with immunotherapy, in, in my opinion. Do you have anything? <laughs> it, it seems to me, you know, that EGFR tumors are very different from the ALK tumors, and you know, the mechanism of resistance that there may be some overlap that doesn't seem to be a lot. And it looks to me like we're dealing with infinity almost as you start trying to work out, you know, all the mutations and, uh, you know, and all of the, and then have a targeted agent for each one. Mm -hmm. 
So I think uh, it's a good question, I mean, in terms of things. I think that, you know, I think I agree with you that the best shot's up front. We want to have our probably our most active drug up front because even under the best of circumstances, some people don't transition to the second line therapy. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, and a lot of qu questions there, I think that uh, the rare genotypes are going to get harder and harder to define and develop, you know, economically and other things like this. But at the same time, I think the cost of doing these next generation sequencing is going down. The FDA just approved foundation medicine, so our ability to identify these rare mutations are, is getting easier than it, than it ever was at this point. And I think that for those patients that do have the mutations, it takes them down a, a totally different paradigm that, that works quite well. We also know that chemotherapy works, but you know I think it's not a long-term solution. And as we've said that immunotherapy has a lower response rate generally in these mutation types, so I think they're still worth investigating. I would also add that the prevalence of these mutations in lung cancer is low, but if you sort of multiply that across the 220,000 people who get lung cancer each year, it's relatively high in terms of the patient population, possibly higher than the rate of CML and other uh, malignancies that we see routinely are Hodgkin's disease. So I still think that's uh, worth pursuing these, these rare mutation subtypes. Tom, the allotment versus smart combination has been around for a long time. We showed the accrued data. <laughs> As I understand, the Japanese cooperative group, I think it's the Western Japan cooperative group, will be reporting their phase three results on this combination this year, 2018. Mm. Uh, what sort of benchmarks do you think will from that trial will bring it versus map into the ETF markets. So I think uh, I think I think that the combination is probably going to have a PFS around 16 to 18 months, which is going to be lesser than the, you, what you get with your osimertinib data. Um, and I think that the, the question that now becomes, should we combine osimertinib with bevacizumab or another uh, uh, VEGF inhibitor to maybe push your, the PFS up to 30 months? I don't see their lotnib and bevacizumab, f frankly, being adopted, you know, even if that trial's positive, which we expect it to be, just because osimertinib, I think, has overtaken it at this point. Um, I think I'd be interested to, to understand why this combination works a little bit better, um, because I think there's, uh, there's been some explanation, but there's not been a, a you know, definitive explanation why this would work. Particularly the European data that shows that there's a correlation of T790 status. My thought is that's just more a prognostic effect in a single arm study rather than a biological That, uh, that's one of the challenges, I think, with single-arm studies is you don't know if it's prognostic. And then I think the T790M testing they did was much more sensitive than what the, the standard testing was available at the time, leading to a higher prevalence. Um, and then you don't know if there are other prognostic factors there. So I think um, the, well, the European data is somewhat uh, provocative. I don't think it's sort of definitive. And you know, we're obviously hoping to find some more uh, testing. But our trial is going to be like 88 patients. It probably won't be definitive on the, the piece, people with baseline T790M. Tom, Tom Gray, Shock. Uh, hmm. At this point in time, when you see a new stage four patient, a new, what molecular panel do you recommend, and where do you see that in two or five years? So uh, this is an evolving question. At uh, Duke, we get the ALK, ROS1, and PDL1, um, and that's done by one lab. Then we generally do the COBOS test because we can get it back in like three to five days. So that's our initial rapid screen to make treatment decisions. Then we generally have been sending it out to Foundation Medicine. About a year ago, what we were doing was our own in-house NGS panel, and we had challenges with turnaround time uh, in terms of two to three weeks. And then the panel just could not keep up with the current uh, literature in terms of med exon 14. Um, it doesn't, and I think they, in pathology, wanted to keep up, but it's just very hard to validate these assays. You know, when you have enough positives, when you're one one center at this point. So, and I think going forward, I think we're going to probably keep ours the same because we what we really want to focus on is making that treatment decision in the first week for the patient, and then doing a more comprehensive. Uh, test at, once you get those back at this point. How do you do the testing here? <laughs>
Yeah. Like everyone else. So for us, since it's a reflex test, by the time I see the patient, the, the results are available at a week away from getting it. Yeah. Turnaround our time is approximately three weeks for the whole time. And we don't do the COBAS or the uh, rapid PCR at this point. Yeah. The COBAS test, I think, is uh, it was a function of necessity, you know, rather than a, uh, ideally. Uh, UNC did reflex testing, Duke does not, and that means that when you're seeing that patient, you're already a little bit a week behind between what's going on, and so you know may, you can sort of preempt that by ordering, looking ahead on your schedule, but that doesn't capture the patient who was added on like uh, the day before the clinic or something like that. Um, and I think that's, you know, ideally we would do something more similar to yours if we could just drive our turnaround time down. Yeah. Uh, if you had the option of choosing the next week, would that be your preferred agent? And the reason for asking that is, uh, you know, recognizing passing data in 2012, our group was simply very similar to that a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And what was obvious was that part of the long duration of response that we see in Osimati largely has to do with the fact that it reduces a as opposed to some of the other EDA particular we only use cytostatin mm -hmm. uh, cytostasis. But we also recognize that you do not need the full dose of osimertin once the cell has become resistant in order to overcome it. Mm -hmm. I know the first four and two days with osimertin was very toxic. Mm -hmm. And because of that experience, you know, everybody that you talk to about combining their neck inhibitor with Another agent always goes, they will always go back to the initial experiment. I'm wondering whether you're confident that you have the right regimen or would you rather prefer a different method if it doesn't go So I think um, we were content with selimentinib, partly because of some of the POSSE's data and also because of the TATIN trial. But I agree that the, there's still concerns about the tolerability. And one of the endpoints we have is six month. Uh, uh, compliance with the, the combination. Yeah. We've written in dose reductions for the selumetinib a little bit more uh, generously than the osimertinib because we don't want to inhibit that. And I think we're going to have to really watch this. A lot of these phase one data, I think they're very preliminary in terms of that. I think part of the partnership with selumetinib too is that it was an AstraZeneca drug and osimertinib so that when we made, went to make synergy, especially under the NCCN uh, request for proposals, it made it a little bit easier for us to, to achieve funding. I was surprised by that data. <laughs> um, I'm still sort of digesting it. So what Tofik's talking is that uh, historically single agent immunotherapy had a response rate of around 5 to 10 percent in the EGFR mutant or ALK positive space. There was a trial that randomized carbotaxol uh, bevacizumab uh, versus carbotaxol bevacizumab and atezolizumab. And they enrolled patients that had been previously treated uh, with EGFR and ELK tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And there was an improvement in progression-free survival. I think the hazard ratio was around 0.79. I think this sort of raises the question is that if immunotherapy is going to be used, it might, might have to be used in combination with chemotherapy. Um, I'm still sort of perplexed uh, about the results of that, that trial, especially in that subset. We don't have data from the carbopem pembrolizumab group because those patients were excluded from that trial. So uh, we don't know if that might be that combination may be the equivalent better or, or not at this point, so. The other thing in that trial is that cohort found 30% of the patients had not received any prior DKI, mm. even though the trial protocol required them. Mm. There were a lot of Eastern European sites that had patients who did not have any DKI available, so it was a slightly different patient. Gotcha. All right.